this, co this coming Wednesday, so on Wednesday, 6 o'clock, Fellowship Hall. And if anyone wants to come help us with our decorations, we will be meeting Wednesday at 1 o'clock to finish getting the Fellowship Hall ready. And if we're not ready, then we'll be meeting at 1 o'clock on Thursday. Um, and if we can get a couple of you stronger guys to help us bring up the television from downstairs to the fellowship hall would be great because it is um, a little on the bigger, heavier, bulkier side. Um, so that's that. Making notes for myself. Our Wednesday night Bible study. We will be meeting. On Wednesday night, the 12th, it will be an intergenerational VBS night that night. So adults, come. I know for some of us, it's, it's been a couple years since we've been in a VBS. And we've participated in VBS. But who doesn't want to be a kid again? So we welcome everybody to come and be part of VBS and be a hero with us. Wesley Women are not meeting in July because, well, we're going to be working a lot with VBS. So that is our meeting this month. Lead team will be meeting on July 6th at 6 o'clock in the College of Hall. The end of July, we're already looking ahead a little bit. We will be feeding the hungry at Trinity again uh, on July 31st. Some more details coming in the future for anybody who wants to help with that. And with that, I think that's all of my everything that, that I needed. Yep. With that, please don't forget to sign the attendance tag. And we got one more announcement. Yeah. So we got the uh, six trials for July the night. That's what two weeks from today. Yeah. Next Sunday, we could let's have a. A list in there of how many, how many, how many plates they want because it's hard to do a fish fry and not have a count. Yes. And uh, it, I mean, really hard. So we don't want to run out, and it's for a good cause. Yes. Uh, trying to help Nicole and <coughs> Daniel with a fancy father. So we we'll get a count next week. Okay. Great. You got it. So fish fry for uh, Nicole, Faith, is in two weeks. So if they, they can get a count next week, which is great. Any other announcements? Is that everything? Okay. With that, let us continue with our worship. With our opening hymn, Be Still My Soul.
crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to the judge and quit and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the meaning of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body of life.
been to Bing. You've been to see at you and I. I don't know. The you went on an island. And a cruise. And a cruise. I mean Universal. And Universal. Gee, I haven't been anywhere. <laughs> <laughs>
loves them and used them just as God loves and uses us, no matter who we are or what our flaws are. We have a story today, right? Our story today is a tale of two mothers. One is a free woman. The other is a slave. One has property. The other is property. One has little to worry about. The other has lots to worry about. If we come back just a little bit in our story, we'll remember that God had promised Abraham and Sarah that they would have children. That Abraham would be the father of many nations. And Sarah, in her old age, would give birth to a son. Sarah, however, was a little on the impatient side. And by a little, she was a lot on the impatient side. She didn't want to wait for that time of when God was going to lift her barrenness. She wanted to go ahead and start that family, start having those sons and making that great nation that God had promised right now. God said, it's not time for you yet, Sarah. But Sarah says, oh, I need us now. So instead of waiting, she gives her slave, Adar, to Abraham. And says, Abraham, since I cannot bear, bear children, bear sons for you, take my slave Hagar. And, of course, when <coughs> Hagar got pregnant and gave birth to a son, Sarah had that little bit of jealousy rise up. <coughs> Hagar fled into the wilderness running away, not knowing what to do or where to go. But God said, hey, God, I'm not done with you yet. Go back. See how this all plays out. And so she does. But let's stop right there for just a minute. When you think of the wilderness in the Bible, what do you think of? Do you think of people wandering around, maybe for, I don't know, 40 years? <laughs> Do you think of a Savior, a Messiah, just starting out in his ministry, going out for, oh, I don't know, let's just say 40 days, and being tempted? The wilderness is often a place of difficulty, but it's also a place where God is with us, and we start to see God's promises coming into view and into fruition. The wilderness is a place where God takes the unlikely and is really present with them. And it's no different here for Hagar. So she leaves the first time. God convinces her to return. And after she returns and is home for a little bit, Sarah gives birth. She has a son, and his name is Isaac, which means with laughter. Now, there's probably a few years that have passed from the time Abraham took Hagar till the birth of Isaac. And probably a couple more years 
Isaac was probably about two, maybe three, at the beginning of this story when he was weaned. Just because the life expectancy would have been so short that Abraham would not want to prematurely celebrate this child and wean him early from his mother. So probably Isaac's a toddler. And at this point we once again see Hagar, the slave, fleeing into the wilderness because of Sarah. And that's where we picked up today. We don't know what Sarah saw. We don't know what Ishmael, Hagar's son, was doing to or with or for Isaac. We just know that they were together and Sarah saw this. It could have been that Ishmael was just playing with his little brother. And they were playing happily and sharing their joy together. It could be that Ishmael was making fun of Isaac. We don't know. It just says Sarah saw something and they got upset. Ishmael at this point is probably early teens. <clears throat> just because of the time the uh, time passing. And whatever it was that Sarah saw, it made her mad enough that she went to Abraham and said, that's it. My son gets your inheritance, not her son. Even though he's your oldest, I'm your primary wife. My son, our son, gets the inheritance. She's got to go. Ishmael and Hagar have to go. Now, Abraham loves his son, loves Ishmael. He loves Isaac as well, but he loves Ishmael too. After all, Ishmael is his firstborn son. So there's this difficult decision that Abraham has to make. It's not like he just says, okay, Sarah, whatever you say, that's what we'll do. He's got to decide. And you can almost feel in that one verse the tension that Abraham is feeling between these two mothers. And you can hear him cry out to God. Even though scripture doesn't say he cried out to God, what do I do? You can feel it. And God says, Abraham, it's okay. Do what Sarah asks. Send Hagar and Ishmael away. I will not forget them. I will take care of your son for you. That promise of many nations will still stand. It is through Isaac, the son of your primary wife, Sarah, who the greatest nation of, and my people will come. But I will not forget Ishmael, the Egyptian woman's son. So Abraham makes that difficult decision, and the next day he gets. <laughs> I'm good. At that. I'll mute that. That's my my mic died. You put it in fresh batteries, it dies. <clears throat> so, can you still hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is why, part of why I sit down here. I'm closer. You can hear me better. So Abraham that morning gets up, and you can feel that he's getting up early. He's preparing for their journey. He doesn't want to send his son and his son's mother away. But he packs up food and rations and gets a big skin of water and gives it to them preparing them for a journey out into the wilderness 
Abraham doesn't know what is coming. But he knows and he trusts that God is going to be there regardless of where they go. Hagar, our second mother, the Egyptian slave woman, she has no choice. She has to do what she is bid to do, and so she once again flees, taking with her her son, Ishmael. You imagine like refugees that are coming, fleeing a war-torn country, and they are only escaping with the clothes on their back and whatever they can carry. It's kind of like Hagar in this moment. Those refugee mothers who carry a pack with some food, maybe some clothes, some pers very personal things that they just can't leave behind and their young child in their arms. Fleeing from the enemy. That is Hagar in this moment. Except her enemy isn't an army. She's not at war, per se, but her enemy is Sarah. <coughs> Abraham, bless you. Abraham's wife. And Hagar has nothing to her name that she can take with her other than her son and the food and water that Abraham has packed for her and given to her. <coughs> And as the days go on, as they're wandering out in the wilderness, under that unrelenting sun, that hot sun beating down on them. And I looked at pictures. Actually, this picture is pretty accurate of what the desert of Beersheba looks like. It's kind of rocky, but it's also kind of barren. There's not a lot of ways to escape from that blistering sun. And as they're going, their water starts to run out. They become weaker and more and more dehydrated. Their food is running low. In case you're wondering, you can go 21 days without food. But you can only go for three days without water. Hagar knows they can't live without that water. You can imagine her, this mother that's going to do whatever it takes for her son, rationing out the water and the food, making sure that Ishmael has more than she does. But she knows she cannot bear to watch her son in misery. So she finds a little shade spot under a little bush where she puts her son, lays him down, and says, now stay here. I kind of get that image of a Mom de mama dear, a doe, hiding her little fawn in the thicket, trying to protect him the best she can while she goes off to do what she needs to do. And they're both miserable, and they both start crying out to God. God, where are you? God, help us, take us away. God, end this misery. Of course, God knows what's going on. Because God has promised to be with them. And when they cry out for relief, God grants that relief. Hagar cries out, in resignation that she and her son would die under that unrelenting sun. That blistering heat would take them. And she knew that because she
she was a slave. Even if she saw someone out there, they're not going to help her. So she was sent away. Even though in being sent away, she was kind of being freed from her slavery, in the eyes of others, she would not have been free. She still would have been seen as that Egyptian slave. She still would have been seen as inferior, less than, marginalized, an outcast, different. Yet God still has a plan for Hagar and for Ishmael. God still saw them. God still heard them. And God still used them for the betterment of all of creation. The ones that were looked down on, God promised to make a great nation out of. Remember, Hagar was an Egyptian. Well, after God answered the cries, God says, Hagar, why are you crying out? You can just hear her desperation. We're going to die. Hagar, look over there. What are you sitting next to? And sure enough, God shows her a well. Now, whether that well was there the whole time and she just hadn't noticed, or if that well just appeared, I don't know. I just know that there was a well there that they could drink from. I personally, side note, I personally think that that well appeared, in case anyone's wondering. But they were able to go to that well. She was able to go get Ishmael from under the bush, bring him to the water, to the source. They were able to restore their health and their life and their strength through that living water that was placed before them. And as they grew in their strength and Ishmael grew in his abilities, we know that he was a great, became a great archer. I imagine that he probably hunted the little animals that are out there on the desert. They probably continued on their way through the desert. And finally, Hagar says, Ishmael, you stay here. You be my desert son. I'm going back to Egypt. And I'll find you a wife so you can start your family and your life. And she does. Who else do we know from Egypt? Is there another big somebody that you think of that maybe went to Egypt at some point a little bit later down the road from this? Maybe he was sold into slavery by his brothers. Maybe his brothers came and he was able to save them after seven years of famine. In that one verse, in our passage in Genesis today, God tells us all is well with Hagar and with Ishmael. God keeps his promise that Ishmael gives life to a nation. We know that Ishmael returns to Egypt with his wife and that through their story, through their people, Egypt becomes a great nation. Later helped by Joseph, one of the descendants of Isaac. The two brothers are joined together again later on down the story through their descendants. That son, that discarded 
son. He was outcast, marginalized, looked down on. The son of a slave, God still uses him. And if God can use that discarded son of a slave to make a great nation, what can God do with you and with me? As children of God, we are free from slavery. We are closer to Isaac than we are to Ishmael in the eyes of God. In the God's eyes, we are not outcasts. We are not ones to be looked down on. No, we are God's children who are adopted. We are free from the clutches of sin and death. And we, too, are safely guarded within the wilderness of this world by our Creator and our Savior and the Holy Spirit, our Advocate. Our cries of anguish and despair as we live in this wilderness do not go unheard. God hears each one of us, and God uses each one of us, no matter how downtrodden we are, how much of an outcast the world sees us to be. God says, my child, I love you. Turn around and look. There's a well there for you. And all who believe are able to turn around and freely drink of that life-giving water. Those living waters. Because God loves, protects those in this world. Even if this world might not protect them. And God loves, cares for, and protects those who we might not think of as worthy even when it might be us that we think are not worthy. God said, you are all worthy. And even if we don't know the plans that God has for us, God knows those plans. And we can trust that those plans are good and will come in God's time not ours. And for that, we can give thanks and say, Amen.
giving up hope but in knowing that your love and your presence is with us. And we pray this all in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Our prayer of confession, storytelling God, you weave your tales of love and wonder into our world. You leave chapters in every rose petal and in every senior's walk. You hide your paragraphs in every sunset in each wave. Only we don't see. Some of us have no time to dwell in the unfolding story of creation. Our days are blurs and our nights are restless, and our calendars are double booked. Some of us have substituted the quick romance story for the eternal love story. We try to substitute fast cars, quick investments, gated houses, new computers, and temporary relationships for the, for the pervasive, enduring love of God. We let lesser choices crowd out time for the community of faith. Loving God, write us into your ongoing showing love story. Open us to wonder and tears, laughter and grief, for you are the author of life and the keeper of stories. Amen. Will you stand and join us in our hymn of invitation? The time where if you wish to come and join on the altar rail to pray, join the church, whatever. We invite you. The front is open. Stand and join us. On Eagle's Wings, we'll sing it through two times. <laughs>